Hey yo, and welcome back to Thinking and Drinking. In this week's episode, we'll be talking about how I've stayed, well, relatively sane thus far during the pandemic. Come to think of it, that's a really good question. So kick back, relax, pour yourself a beverage, and let's get to it. I was playing World of Warcraft yesterday when I heard a lovely cover of Fatboy Slim's song Praise You coming from one of my side monitors. I glanced over to see what it was, and dishearteningly enough, it was a commercial for Advil, in which they were rather mawkishly praising all of us for sticking together through the pain and the hard times of the plague. And I'll admit, I got annoyed irrationally annoyed at first, but after thinking about it, I realized that maybe it's not so irrational after all, because that song is one of my favorite good mood songs, and they were co-opting it to try and sell us over-the-counter painkillers during a time of national crisis. Thinking about all of this, well, for those of you who've been following along for a while, you know that this year so far has really been crap for me. Um, just to recap, my birth dad got sick and then died at the beginning of the year. I spent my birthday weekend and the next two weeks after that incandescently ill with the flu. I am still in awe of my students for sticking with me during that period because that was some hot nonsense. Um, and then, after that, came the Rona. Washington State went into a state of lockdown while the CDC was still figuring out whether the fuck we needed to wear masks or not. And while people were still waffling around about that, well, I got sick. Again, five months after that, it still feels like my lungs are filtering air through aquarium gravel. Um, other than a stop at a Waffle House for some takeaway, Upon my arrival in Virginia, I haven't been to a restaurant in five months. And to add on to that, my grandmother died of terminal cancer on July 4th. Um, in, between, in between her diagnosis and the time that she died, I was told by the caregivers at the hospice, do not come to visit, because we don't want to risk you getting any of the staff or any of the other patients sick. I understand that, and I'm not mad about that at all. Um, what I am mad about is that we have had six months, and maybe even a few months of warning before that, and we, that is to say America as a country, we have not gotten our collective shit together. That's what makes me angry. I'm not talking about the protests in Portland and other cities similar to that. I'm not talking about that at all. I am talking about weddings and picnics and concerts and political gatherings where people just say, screw it, and get all up in each other's personal space because freedom and all these health guidelines are obviously a conspiracy to curtail our rights. Yes, that's me being sarcastic, by the way. I had a conversation with a relative on the phone about this recently, and I said, in regards to these people who think that after close to 180,000 deaths from coronavirus, after all of that, people still think this is a conspiracy, my thoughts about that are, God love ya, because I certainly can't. I really have no love left for these kinds of idiots. The cynic in me wants to say that this whole thing is like an, well, like the Darwin Awards in action. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Darwin Awards, they are an unofficial recognition 
for the most stupid death. Think like a person who got crushed by a soda machine because they decided to try and tip it to get their overpriced beverage out. That's an example of the Darwin Awards. Um, it would be all too easy and, quite frankly, grabbing low-hanging fruit to think that this is some grand scheme on the divine level of weeding out all of the stupid. Um, the thing is, though, is... Schadenfreude is only delicious for a moment, and then you have to start thinking about the fallout for all of this. Think about all of the people who have weak immune systems, people who are oh, people who are elderly, people who can't really survive well, and even if they do survive they're going to have to be dealing with lifelong side effects. That's the fallout of people being stupid. So go ahead and laugh all you want, but remember, there is more to it than just that. I got only a mild case of it, and I'm going to have to deal with breathing issues and increased fatigue for a while now. It's been five months. And I'm lucky. I'm lucky that that's all I have to deal with also, this is on top of a bunch of other chronic conditions that I've dealt with since I was 18. So I've had years and years of practice in managing not only physical symptoms, but also the psychological weight of being disabled. And yes, there is a psychological weight. Now, look at all the people who were healthy beforehand and now are having to deal with long-term side effects that they didn't imagine that they would ever have to deal with until they were a lot older. Those breathing issues, a reduced amount of stamina, all of that. They don't have the psychological framework to deal with that. And we're also dealing with a society that tends to stigmatize people who are disabled. Yeah. It's because of this that I really can't be optimistic. So all of this started out as what could have been a potentially enjoyable and temporary retreat from society, for me, an ambivert. It has now turned into a daily, a daily habit of doom scrolling and looking at the news and seeing people flouting health guidelines and I can only think, what the fuck, America? Come on now. Again, I'm not talking about the Black Lives Matter protests. So long as the culture of police brutality against innocent black people like Breonna Taylor, like Jacob Blake, George Floyd, so many of those others, so long as that culture continues, so will the protests. And in case you've forgotten, in case these protests have you all hot and bothered, civil unrest is in America's DNA. We didn't get independence by asking nicely. This is, this is in our country's DNA and the way we're programmed. So if you are really getting upset over property damage and you aren't upset by innocent people being hurt and killed by a system that's ostensibly supposed to serve and protect them, then you really need to get your shit straight. I'm not even sorry. Something else to think about is that all of these people who are gathered together to protest, they are actually doing more to stop the spread or potential spread of the virus. They are social distancing, they're, they're using masks and hand san sanitizer and PPE. And by doing more, you have protesters who are doing more for public health than, say, a fucking Smash Mouth concert or the... Republican National Convention. Let that percolate for a little while. I started out six months ago sicker than a dog, and I was glad for the chance to have a work schedule that would allow me to work from home in my pajamas and rest when I needed to. My biggest priorities at that time were getting well and not dying and doing my job as a teaching assistant and as a teacher, and finishing up my master's thesis. 
I remember grading my last batch of final papers, and I was so glad that I had the shelter of my apartment where I could sit privately and process the sheer what the hell of a student who was trying to argue that Johnny Cash was a, was a pro-establishment figure. And not just that, that, that Johnny Cash would be dismayed at seeing the country that he loved burning from protests. Yeah, that actually did happen. And it's a topic for another day. But yeah. What else did I do? I perfected the decadent chocolate cake, and I honed my whole wheat bread baking technique. I turned into one of those annoying people who works out in their living room. I played Jackbox games over Twitch with my friends. I had uh, TV and movie watch parties with those same friends. I even found D&D group, and we're still together. That's great. I've played a lot of video games. I endured the obligatory quarantine thirst period. And I even got into Warhammer 40k. About that last bit, I blame my older brother's influence. Um, well, that and a divine batch of gin from Spokane's own Dry Fly Distillery. For my brother, I could hear that dearly departed jackass laughing at me all the way from the beyond as I clicked by on a box army set of Sisters of Battle and paints and all the other assorted kit that goes with it. Including a uh, batch of fancy terrain dirt that has sparkly pebbles in it. Yep, I paid actual money for someone else's dirt. That's what tabletop wargaming does, I guess. Now, don't get me wrong, I've found great escapist pleasure in painting these minis. I've even taken recommendation from friends that I've found in, well, in this hobby world for the best effects for recreating blood, splat blood splatters and combat grime. I've also found a certain amount of morbid irony that I am finding escape in a fantasy world where the military forces of an immortal god emperor are waging a rampant crusade trying to either uh, to either convert everyone around them or eradicate people who aren't like them. I joke that the aesthetic of 40k is kind of like goth Portlandia a skull on it. And I take pride in the small details, like the glittering shades of blue and green on the electric flails of my arcoflagellants. Yes, it's beautiful. But I know that the extremes in this fictitious world, in this fictitious setting, are satirical. They aren't meant to be taken seriously. I've also made some wonderful friends through this hobby, who in real life fight for the rights of the, well, of the underprivileged. They fight for the rights of genders and sexualities. So they are anything like what's being portrayed in this game. We joke about living under the dominion of Nurgle, the chaos god of plague. We share memes and fanfiction, and we support each other by offering, well, by offering really nice commentary on each other's minis and sharing videos for techniques that will make our painting even better. All of this is a great buffer against the occasional neg that I get from salty-ass grognards who are insecure that it takes me only a few hours to get really good results when they are still struggling after a long time. But I can't do anything about that, so I lean on my friends. But I digress. As morbid as the setting is, this community has the kind of resilience that you can't find in a commercial. You'll see that in other creative communities, too. Even as the world is on fire, in some places, literally, we gather around, we find our friends, we make art, we tell stories, we find heroes when we need them and where we need them, even if those heroes aren't real. 
That said, for all of the coziness and community that I've found while I've been staying at home, I long for the day when I can actually go out to a restaurant with my friends and I don't have to worry about getting possibly fatally ill from a stranger breathing on me when they shouldn't. I dream of going to a movie theater and the grossest thing that will happen is somebody taking off their shoes like they're at home. And I simply cannot wait to be able to vote in an election and not be worried about people breaking social distancing or my mail-in ballot getting conveniently lost. I really can't wait. And also, as a neurodivergent person, I am looking forward to when we can interact in person because I need those body language cues to be able to tell when people are clicking or not. I depend on those, even in regular interactions. Even better, I've taken advantage of this time when I've been by myself to get my brain stuff right, so who knows? Assuming that we can actually, you know, meet in person anytime soon, I might be willing to try dating again. Because apps really aren't my jam. The swiping and super liking and sliding into DMs, I just really don't get that. I don't, I don't know. But what I do know is that life is better lived with other people. And we really can't do that until we decide to prioritize the health and long-term well-being of the collective over momentary pleasure of the individual. And you've probably heard this metaphor before, but, you know, it's kind of like a condom. Wear your fucking mask. Don't be a dink. That's all I've got for you today. Come on back next week when I talk about the mechanisms and habits that I've developed to save money and avoid people.